Greetings and welcome to this mini lecture on hegemony and popular culture. The idea of hegemony comes from us from Antonio Gramsci, a uh, Italian philosopher writer who wrote a lot in the 1920s and 30s and, and was able to kind of capture what, what ultimately, I don't know, not certainly not predicted, but elements that contributed to ultimately the uh, the rise of the Third Reich and World War II and the like. At the center of this idea of hegemony is culture is a continual struggle back and forth between ruling an elite and underclasses. But that back and forth is really the elites attempting to negotiate and maintain their power over the underclasses by either shifting, influencing, or making certain things more appealing, acceptable, reasonable within, uh, within popular culture, or within the culture as a whole, I should say. So, uh, here's another quote from Dominic Stranati, who I, I've mentioned before in this, this lecture series, and it's cultural, cultural and ideological means whereby the dominant groups in society, including fundamentally, but not exclusively, the ruling class, maintain their dominance by securing the spontaneous consent of subordinate groups, including the working class. This is achieved by the negotiated construction of a political and ideological consensus, which incorporates both dominant and dominated, gr dominated and dominated groups. All right, so there's a, there's a lot here to unpack, but um, I mean, ultimately we're looking at this idea of those, those dominant groups still hold on to uh, hold on to power and privilege, but at the same time, w through through a mixture of different ways, uh, convince or some might say manipulate. Uh, some might say actually in open negotiation with those underclasses to find some consensus or some means of maintaining the status quo, in so much as the bigger structure is is there. In other words, they'll, they'll negotiate or the, there'll be an attempt to provide for smaller wins, but the larger structure still keeps those in power in power. So this is how it works. The ruling class or the dominant group that provides compromises, the ruling class accepts those compromises to various degrees. And change occurs, but often it's not substantial, um, enough to be marginally inclusive. And so it's this idea that, you know, there is change that occurs, but it's never been so much change that has disrupted the full power structure as it stands. Um, and so all of this ends up being reinforced and played out or negotiated even within popular culture. And we'll take a look at how and what that is or what that means. So you want to be thinking about this idea of, of, of hegemony, cultural hegemony. Uh, we see political hegemony in which, you know, different powers. The U.S. is actually, there's a lot of hegemonic negotiation, I guess you could say, um, between the U.S. and other countries. And there's a lot of butting heads that goes on now between the U.S. and China because China is no longer under or as under the thumb of the U.S. in terms of political power and political might. Other countries, too, are finding themselves not necessarily as easily um, nudged as they might have in, in decades past. So domination, that domination and influence comes from intellectual and moral leadership. And so that means we see this in the form of producers, distributors, interpreters of culture, um, you know, publishers. These are the people that help to shape and renegotiate those, those relationships, those compromises as they were. And that culture is being p perpetually negotiated. Right, that this is something that's constantly happening in many different ways, in many different arenas. It is not just one thing happening at one time, but lots of different things because we're dealing with different populations, different marginal groups, different um, types of underclasses and identities within that. So let's take a look at some examples. Uh, for those of you that are comics, comic readers, um, the character Kevin in the comic book series Archie was what some would call a hegemonic compromise. Kevin is a homosexual and so he was the first gay character to be introduced into Archie comics and really you know the 
the idea here is that what the publishers have done is an attempt to not alienate all of you know certain types of readership in this what had been a very heteronormative and very you know very Anglo or European derived comic attempt to introduce some diversity by introducing Kevin who is homosexual and is seen as a as a good character isn't demonized isn't isn't representative negative or anything like that so there's a good example in which hegemonic forces they allow for this right but at the same time in in bringing Kevin in doesn't necessarily attempt to ac actually question the larger structure of the narratives and the myths embedded within Archie comics it just it abates or it soothes without actually disruption or disrupting Black Entertainment Television is another great example in which, you know, here's this TV station that's largely geared towards entertainment relating to, connected with, representing uh, African Americans. And here again is this idea of something being provided, which is a, pl a place where, you know, you can catch the, or you can, you can see strong positive representations of African Americans in a variety of forms. And therefore, that in some ways justifies a lack of or not as equal representation, of course, in all the other channels. So it's a compromise. It's saying, okay, we'll give you representation, but that means to some degree the other stations don't have to pay as much attention to it or feature or create shows that are more targeted towards minorities. Some do, but others don't. And so this is one of those things that, that you can be that can be seen as hegemony at play in which, you know, there's there's this an allowance, there's this compromise that's made, but that compromise doesn't actually upset or reconsider the overall power structure. Uh, the Motion Picture Movie Association of America and their T V rate or their film rating system, I would say, is um, certainly an example of hegemony in which you have the people in power, they, they switch, they go from having a censorship code, what was known as the Hayes Code, into this ratings code that allows for creators to make any kind of film they want knowing that it's going to have a certain rating to go along with it. And it is it is a compromise. It's it's allowing for for people to be free, but at the same time, you know that rating system itself is problematic. That rating system itself and who decides what gets a you know what gets a rated X or a rated NC-17 versus a rated R, uh, as the documentary this film is not yet rated shows, can be very arbitrary. And so that's something to be concerned about. And finally, we have recycling and people might not fully understand uh, how is recycling an example of, of hegemony well if we look at recycling what it asks us to do is to take what we've gotten and when we're done with it make sure it gets fed back into uh, you know the process but it never so that's that's the negotiation that's going on it never it allows us to feel like well we're not being wasteful uh, but it never actually has us questioning how much we're consuming and how much we're wasting, right? How many things we're buying and bringing in and then spitting out. And I think that's a very interesting uh, element or, or example of hegemony at work in which the power structure, at least within a capitalist society, does demand for people to buy, 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 to consume, to get goods, to get services. And this offering up of well we want to do this right we you know we want to be we want to be environmentally responsible so we should recycle uh, is a little bit at odds because to be environmentally correct would mean to reconsider the entire structure but hegemony has us decide that well we'll recycle and that's our compromise and that's what we're looking at here is the ways in which you know you really do see these compromises that don't make us really question or reinvent or, or, or change what it is we're doing but just further get you know further feel like we're being heard and then therefore not feeling the need to take as drastic change as might be needed wanted or desired again this is this is the idea behind hegemony uh, it's it's still a theory or it's still something that people are 
could argue in a variety of different ways, but this is what a hegemony, or these are examples in which hegemony could be seen. All right, that's all for this mini lecture. Thank you very much for watching, and see you in the next one.